Thank you, Mr. Haskins. Shall we bow together in prayer? Children may go to their Bible time. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for the God that you are, God who's holy, God who reigns over all, and God who is God of love to help us meet our needs, provide our salvation. Pray, Father, for your blessing on hearts this morning. Pray for those that are laid aside with illness, Lord, and difficulties. Be help to them. We pray, Father, for our missionaries as they serve you in other places. We think of the Lloyds there in Italy. Bless and encourage them in their ministry. We pray, Father, for uh, our country in these days of confusion, that you might turn people's hearts to thee and realize that the only security, the only real means of blessing is to seek and to follow the ways of righteousness according to our God. We pray, Lord, that you might uh, just to guide our leaders and give them wisdom and insight to do which is right. We pray, Father, that you might bless each one who's here this morning. You know the need of every heart. Lord, if there be those who do not know Christ as Savior, they might realize what folly it is to go through uh, life without knowing where they're going to spend eternity. And so, Lord, bless them from the Word of God this day. And we pray that your Spirit might be our teacher. And we give you thanks for it in Christ's name. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 4. Daniel, chapter 4, that's about the middle of your Bible or somewhere in there. Daniel's book, the fourth chapter. Our subject this morning is the God who reigns. That is the God who is sovereign, the God who sits on the throne as a sovereign over all. Now, we don't understand much the meaning of that word sovereign anymore in these days. But in olden times, when they had sovereign kings, they knew a little better what it meant. The king was sovereign. He could decree whatever. He'd see somebody over there and says, that fellow made an ugly face at me. Take him and chop his head off. And they would. And oh, that man back there, he spit on the ground where I was going to walk. And that shouldn't be done for the king. Take him and put him in the dungeon and leave him there till he starves to death. And he would. And then he said, oh, that man there, oh, that poor man, I kind of like the looks of that man. Build him a palace and put two pantries in there. Fill one with food and the other one with gold. And they would do it. Because he was the sovereign. And his word was the final word. Sovereign, in the original sense of the word, meant absolute control over everything in the empire. Now, that didn't mean that the sovereign king would come to your house in the morning and tell you whether to scramble your eggs or fry them sunny side up. No, he wouldn't do that. But he could if he wanted to, because he was sovereign. And uh, most absolute Sovereigns had that kind of power. In the Bible, the most absolute sovereign that we read of and the most absolute sovereign that this world has ever really known was a man named Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, this man, Nebuchadnezzar, was a mighty sovereign, absolute sovereignty, but God taught him a lesson, and he came to understand that he wasn't in nearly as much control as Almighty God was. And this is what he said about God when he finally came to his senses and understood. It says in Daniel chapter 4, verse 34, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? That's a sovereign. That's a description of Almighty God who is our sovereign. Proper understanding of God's sovereignty, if we would understand it, 
we would fully understand God's sovereignty that would keep us from much pride. We're not nearly as important as we think we are, you know. It would keep us from much worry. What's to worry about if God's in charge? It would keep us from much fear. How can we fear if Almighty God is at our side? It would keep us from much anxiety. Why be anxious when our God is sovereign over all? The proper understanding of the sovereignty of God means that any creature, man, or angel, or devil, can only do what God allows them to do. And God can set them up or take them down in an instant because he is sovereign. Now, I want you to see many scriptures on this this morning, and so I won't ask you to look at them, but listen let me read them. And notice, first of all, what different people said about God as sovereign. Back in the Old Testament, we read about a woman named Rahab. A wicked woman growing up in an idolatrous nation, but she heard about Israel and she learned about their God. And she said this to the spies that came to her house. She, she said, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. He's God over all. Another woman named Sam uh, Hannah, mother of Samuel was for years without a child. She prayed for a child, and God gave her a child, and she said this, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. That's a good description of a sovereign God. He lifts up, he puts down at his will. David, great king of Israel, said this to God. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. Thou art exalted as head above all. And in another place he said, Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. Later, a king named Jehoshaphat, a good man, in a time of difficulty, he prayed and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest thou not over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? And God answered that with a resounding yes by completely defeating Jehoshaphat's enemies. Job Interesting man. And he said this. Now ask the beasts and the fowls of the air, or speak to the earth and the fishes of the sea. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord has wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? God holds every soul, every life in his hand. Sovereign God. Then the prophet Isaiah said this, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof, that's you and me, the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing, but maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. And Daniel Again, quoting Nebuchadnezzar, he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? What are you doing? No, oh, God doesn't have to answer. He's the sovereign. The apostle Paul put it this way. O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Who do you think you are? Can complain about what God's doing. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? If the potter can make the clay as he chooses, certainly God can do with you as he chooses. 
In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, In whom, that is in God and Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Not just the good things, the nice things, pleasant things, but God worketh all things after the counsel of his will. And Paul, dealing with the idolaters in the city of Athens, said this to them, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and if made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. He's the God who put these people here and those people there and these people in this place and so on. Sovereign. Jesus asserted that for himself when he gave the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, that is the power of authority, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And in the book of Revelation, we read about the elders around the throne who sing and say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. All things were made, including us, not to do as we please, but to do as God pleases. And it's plain from the scripture that God is a God who is sovereign, and he reigns over all. He's the one who sits above all on the throne. In First Chronicles, David said, Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nations, The Lord reigneth. Sovereign. Psalm 47. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. And at the close of the book of Revelation, it says this, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. He reigns as king. And in the book of Philippians, Paul describes Christ and it says, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that everything should confess that Jesus, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is, Jesus Christ is sovereign. Everything, everyone will bow and admit that Christ is sovereign. That includes those who deny God. They will bow their knee and acknowledge that he is God. It includes those who ignore God. So many people, maybe you, one of them, I don't know, go through life and you know, maybe you give God a little lip service once in a while, but you're just living to take care of yourself, do your thing and busy about this and that. But someday you'll bow before God and you'll have time to bow on your knee and worship him that lives forever and ever. And this includes those who reject God, say, oh, I don't need to bother about God, I'll go my own way, I'll take care of that some other time, religious matters. I reject God now, but someday you'll bow before God and admit that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And all of those people will get on their knees and admit, Lord, you are sovereign. And if you're here unsaved this morning, be sure you will be in that number. And you will bow your knee before Christ. And though you rejected him and despised him and blasphemed him all your life, on that day you will bow and admit that he is Lord over all. Now let's just, uh, to be a little more clear, look at some specific areas where our God is sovereign, where our God reigns over all. Uh, consider the extent of God's sovereignty. Uh, it's not like God is the sovereign of some little banana republic 30 miles square somewhere. No, that's not it at all. God's sovereignty extends to all parts of the entire universe at all times from beginning to end. And God is not sovereign in some areas some of the time. 
God is sovereign in all areas, all of the time. And so, in order for us to grasp this more clearly, let's notice some of the areas that demonstrate the sovereignty of God. Sovereign control. Think of God's sovereign control over nature. Remember when Jesus was on that storm in Galilee and the waves were coming into the boat and the disciples were sure they were going to drown and Jesus spoke a word and said, be still. And just like that, the waves flattened out and the wind stops blowing because he's over the waves and the wind. I think of Elijah who prayed that there wouldn't be any rain and there was no rain for three years and six months. He prayed again that it would rain. And the rain came down in bucketsfuls. Now think of Jonah running away from God and says, God, send a great wind to threaten, uh, to capsize that ship. God sent that wind. He's over nature. You see, the weather is not controlled by chance or Tom Skillings. God is in control. Nahum said this, the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and the storm. Now, this may not be a good illustration, I know, but a number of years ago, it was very hot, one of those hot summer days, and the air conditioning in this room worked. This is on Saturday night, or early Sunday morning, I should say. Air conditioning. I don't remember what went wrong with it. It wasn't going to work. And uh, it was hot. How are people going to sit in here in this awful heat, not even a fan going, anything? It's so hot. And I prayed, said, Lord, can you do something about this? And I don't know the ins and outs of it, but all of a sudden a cold front moved through and within 15 minutes the temperature dropped, dropped 20 degrees. You say, well, coincidence, well, I don't know whatever it was, but I do know that God's in control of the weather and all of those things. We sang this morning the song, clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. you believe that? That's what God says. God is sovereign over all nature. I remember... When I was a boy, about eight years old, nine years old, in Bible camp, things were kind of primitive in those days. We lived in little cabins on the side of the lake and stayed there. And a tremendous, one early one morning, a tremendous storm came up. Oh, the lightning was flashing and crashing and booming, and the wind was blowing and whipping around. And all of a sudden, there's a great, great crash explosion, and it filled our whole cabin with light. And a bolt of lightning came right through that cabin came in the windows, broke out all the windows, and went out, made a hole in the wall this much over my head. Like that. Not a hair of my head was singed or anything. But God's in control of those things. And God is over all. And uh, we have to recognize that. God has control over nature. And the sovereign control of God extends to his creatures. Remember that little worm? In the book of Jonah, God sent that little worm to eat down the gourd. And that worm did just what he was told and ate that gourd. And remember that great fish that swallowed Jonah? God sent that fish to swallow him up and, and told that fish to go swallow Jonah. And he went and swallowed Jonah. And then God told that fish to burp him out on the shore. And he burped him out on the shore just where God told him to. Remember when Daniel was thrown into that den of a roaring lions? And God shut their mouths so they didn't touch Daniel all night. And the next day when they hauled Daniel out and threw those enemies of his into the den, it says the lions tore them apart before they got to the bottom. God is over the animals and all his creatures. Now remember those crows who aren't known for being benevolent, but they brought bread to Elijah and meat every morning and every evening. God sent them. They did it. And uh, even those cows in the book of Samuel, where the ark had been stolen by the Philistines, and they wanted to send it back, they put it on a cart and tied the cows to it and tied the calves of those cows up at home. And if you know anything about farming, you know the cow will go through any barbed wire fence in the country to get to her calf if she's separated from it. Those cows she went right down the road where God sent them back to Israel to return the ark and to Israel. So all living creatures take orders from a sovereign God. God's over all. 
What about the plant world? God is sovereign over plants. Again, the book of Jodah, God gave order for that gourd to grow up overnight, and just overnight that gourd came from nothing, made a great shelter over Jonah's head, because God told it to. And when Jesus was coming to Jerusalem one morning and he saw that fig tree and it didn't have fruit on it, he pronounced a curse on that tree and within 24 hours it withered away and was dead. And remember Aaron's rod? That old dry piece of wood he'd been carrying around the wilderness? They put it in the ark and the next morning that rod had leaves and buds and almonds growing on it. Sovereign God over nature. All plants grow in accordance to the instructions of a sovereign God. A sovereign God is also over the government rulers, rulers of government. In the book of Romans, uh, Paul says, the rulers that be are ordained of God. God puts them in their position. Maybe they're good rulers, maybe they're bad rulers. But God put them there for his particular purpose. Nebuchadnezzar, we uh, referred to him earlier, that mighty king, greatest sovereign the world has ever known. And God said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're so proud, I'm going to take you down a peg. And he took his mind, and he was a crazy man for, several, for some time. And then God restored his reason again. A pharaoh back there refusing to let the Israelites go. And God said, Pharaoh, you know, you're going to have problems. And Pharaoh lost everything, including his own son, because he rejected, rebelled against God. But he was still under God's control. And there was another king later on, before he was born, God said, there's going to be a man named Cyrus, and he will send the Jews back to rebuild Jerusalem. Some years later, that man was born, became a king, and he gave an order that the Jews should return to Jerusalem. God is sovereign over all the rulers of government. I know you may get all agitated and worked up about what the government rulers are doing or what they shouldn't be doing or whatever. But uh, just keep in mind, God's got them under his thumb and he will do with them as he sees fit. God's sovereign control extends to our possessions, you know. We read the scripture, it says, God maketh rich and maketh poor. Job, God made him a rich man. And then God ordained for all his riches and everything he had to be gone. And then after that, God made him a rich, rich man again. God lifts up and God puts down. And think of Herod, that proud, wicked, ruthless king in the New Testament, sat on his throne and made a great speech. And the people trying to butter him up said, oh, it's the voice of a God. And he accepted their compliments. And it says, God smote him. And his insides were all eaten up by worms. And he died. King Herod, under the control of Almighty God. God controls individuals. And uh, you, young people, perhaps say to yourself, Oh, this is what I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. Wait a minute. You don't know what tomorrow might bring. If God wants you there or someplace else, God will see to it. And you don't have control of your life nearly as much as you think you do. Sovereign God's in control. He may have a different plan than yours. The sovereign control of God even extends over the heavenly bodies. Jesus hung on the cross. And the skies grew dark. Talks of the time when the moon will be turned to blood, that is, in appearance as blood. And I remember Joshua asked God to make the sun stand still, and it did. Look with me, take a moment to turn to Isaiah chapter 40. If you can turn there quickly, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26. The prophet says, Lift up your eyes on high. And behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? That's the stars he's talking about. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. God puts the stars in there, tells them where to go, calls them by name. 
and not one of all those billions of stars in space fails to follow the control of a sovereign God. And they will come and the stars will fall and the earth will wobble off its axis like a drunken man. Oh yes, God will bring that about. God's in control of the heavenly bodies. And so you see, our God is sovereign over all. Usually, God sits on the throne and sets things in their course, and then they follow that program. But God can change the program as he wills any time. For instance, that sun. God doesn't have to push a button every morning for the sun to come up. He gave the sun a pattern to follow, and the earth's rotation, so on, it follows the pattern, but... When God wanted the sun to stand still, it did, because he's sovereign over all. It's interesting. Everything in God's nature, the animals, the plants, the stars, the creation, all follow the instructions of God, except for people. Man rebels against God's program, tries to do things his own way, suffers the consequences thereof. But we have a sovereign God. So what are the lessons and the blessings to be learned from the sovereignty of God? Well, first of all, for believers, we ought to learn obedience. If God is a king, if he sits on the throne and rules, then we ought to better obey and take orders from him. When you see he says it in his word, you better listen. Obedience. And certainly the sovereignty of God means we have security. God says all things work together for good to them who are called according to his purpose. And we can have our security in that. Whatever comes into your life, if you're a believer, God's got a good reason for it. And God knows what it's all about and why and when and all the rest of it. You may not understand it, but a sovereign God sends those things. And he works all together for good. So why need we fret and worry about things? They're under God's control. And certainly if we believe in the sovereignty of God, we ought to have peace. Peace. Why should we worry when God's way is best and God will do and carry out his program? He will carry out the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. God is sovereign. And certainly the sovereign of God ought to give us confidence. Why? God will take care of us. God will provide for us. God will use us. God will enable us. He's God. And the sovereignty of God ought to impact our prayers as well. We call on the God who is able. Able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. We come to a God who is able and we submit our will to the will of God. Lord, your will be done. And we can pray with confidence that God can do and will do that which is right. Oh, how God's people, believers, ought to be encouraged by the sovereignty of God not to live your life fretting and in cares and worrying about this and that. Uh, we are on God's side, and he will carry out his purposes. But the unbeliever, maybe you're here this morning, don't know the Lord is your Savior. What about your relationship to this sovereign God? Do you think you can get by with what you're doing? And the way you're living? You think that'll be, oh, well, it won't make any difference. You're not too bad. There's a lot of people worse than you are. You think you can get by with disregarding the will, the instructions of a sovereign God? Don't fool yourself. You think you can play games with a sovereign God? You think you can ignore him or outwit him or work around him? Oh, you're living in dreamland. God sits on the throne, and someday your knee will bow before him, and you will admit that he is God. How foolish for an unsaved person to go on. And God can, no matter what you do, God can stop you anytime he wants. God can overthrow any plans that you have. And as sure as the sun shines... He can and will bring you before him in that awful day of judgment on the great white throne. 
and condemn you to a lost eternity. So, friend, if you're unsaved here, God commands you to repent. Neither you will repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ and lay hold on his gift of salvation, or you'll not believe. And Jesus said, people are condemned because they believe not. You go your way to a lost eternity. And if you're saved, you can live in peace and security, free of worry and fear and discouragement and turmoil because you have a sovereign God who will care for you and work out his purposes for good. So what's your response to the God who reigns over all? He's not a God who's negligent, absent, absent-minded, so busy with things he doesn't care what's going on in your life. No, God knows, and he's there to save you, to carry out his purposes in your life. Shall we bow in prayer? <clears throat> As we bow in prayer, let me ask you about your relationship to God. Are you knowing him as your savior? Do you know what it means to be in fellowship with this sovereign God? That God of all the universe is concerned to send his son to die to pay for your sins and give you the gift of eternal life, give you salvation as his gift. Will you accept that or reject it? What's your response to him? Are you here this morning? You say, I don't really know God. I, I don't know much about it. Uh, I don't really have any relationship with him. I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity, but I com I'm concerned about it. I'd like to pray for you. Someone can help you to understand that. If you're concerned about your salvation, your relationship with God, would you just, heads are bowed and eyes closed, just raise your hand, put it back down a minute. Yes, are there others? Any others? You're concerned about your relationship with God. Anyone else? Believer, are you here? You're trying to go your own way and leave God out, just do your own thing, live your own life. You realize the folly of that. You want to yield to God that rules this morning, yield your life to him. Stop going your way and doing it your way. Do it God's way. Anyone? Could I pray for you this morning? Just raise your hand. Put it down. Yes, others? Yes, Lord bless you. Any others? Father, we thank you for your grace to us. We thank you for the goodness of God who designed all of this universe so that you could show your love in saving lost sinners and show your holiness by condemning those who reject your son to a lost eternity. Pray, Father, for those who may not understand salvation this morning. You might get hold of their heart and show them their need uh, before it's too late to turn to thee. Pray for those who know you, but they're living their own life. That they might yield their life to thee, we pray. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Take your hymnals and turn with me to number 496. 496. I surrender all, surrendering to him who is our king.